Something that I love doing as a church is going through a book series, whether it be uh, before we did the book of uh, Ephesians, now we're doing the book of, of, of James, and I love it because when you go through a book like this, uh, you can't ignore passages, right? So you guys know, or right, we know, okay, the next verse, the, the next sermon is coming out of the next next scripture in, in James. So we can't ignore hard hard things, we can't ignore tough things, and, and so far James, he's been cutthroat. He's been like, he's, he's, been, he's been talking to us, right, straight, and he's going to, these next two passages, he's talking about um, the rich and the poor. And these are straightforward passages. These are like, all right, just from the word, going forward, going straight. And so this morning, let's read them and, and let's get excited about we can't ignore hard passages in Scripture. They're there. And so let's read them, let's digest them, let's receive from them this morning. So let's read James chapter 5. And it says this. Now listen, you rich people. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe this morning you're thinking, I don't know, I don't know if I can follow that category. Let's read it. Let's receive it this morning. Yeah. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Oh my, what encouraging words this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember um, when Rachel and I spent a time in, in marriage counseling, if you've, if you've ever gone through marriage counseling or, or I could witness it every once in a while, you know, they don't, in marriage counseling, they don't separate, like, okay, they got a husband, you deal with the husband, and then another time you deal with the wife, right? They, you come together, and sometimes it's really messy, right? You're talking, you're in front of the counselor, and you, you tell them all their, your mess, and it's like, oh, my spouse is sitting right next to me and hearing me say these things. And, and then the counselor gets to correct you or encourage you, and, right? and so like you get to receive, and you're listening as the as a husband or, or as the wife, and, and and then vice versa, it goes forward. And you get to listen to both of it, right? So so this morning, right? We don't want to again. We don't want to listen to the other for the other person. The person's not here, right? We can't say, all that. The person that's not here, this sermon was for them. Right, right this morning, the sermon's for us. Amen. God also encourage us. Whether you say, hey, I'm in the poor category, not the rich category, I don't need this sermon. No, we need this sermon because of the Word of God. All right? Oh. So uh, in, in this, we see uh, a great injustice. James is addressing here an injustice. Something that isn't right. And... and, and we want to be a people, right, that are full of who God is, and God is a God who is just. He makes things right. He, he brings right judgment. He brings restoration. He makes things. Uh, this morning, we read in the opening part of our uh, worship gathering, Isaiah 42. He makes the cricket, he makes the rough places smooth. That's right. right. And so some of us are expressing a lie, or we are expressing a lie by how we live. A lie about who God is. And so oh, James wants to correct this in us. He says, hey, don't live in such a way where you are oppressing people, where, where corrosion is in your life, where, where you're withholding weight. Don't live in this way because when you live this way, it tells a lie about who God is. And we want to be people that every area of our life tells the truth about who God is. And when people see us, they say, oh, wow, that I see a truth about who God is. And so we want to examine ourselves and say, are we living in a way that we know to be true most fully in Christ? We can always examine yourself. Am I living in such a way that, that most fully reveals Christ? So part of this here, we see that, that he's rebuking the wealth, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that in, in, with much Great, um, there is great responsibility, right? God has said in Genesis, we have been blessed to be a blessing. There is, there is a blessing in having much. And some of you here, this, this weekend I just got an opportunity. Uh, we're, Rachel and I, again, celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So we, we went through and threw away a whole bunch of clothes. And God blessed us this, this year with a 
a nice tax return and said, all right, let's get, get some new clothes. It was great. You know, I don't think God is rebuking us for having the possessions, for having the wealth. Right, right. It's, it's then how are we, what are we doing with that? What are we, how are we living with that? Because with great responsibility, with great wealth, with great uh, all that we have, there is much to be done. There, there's things that can be done in the kingdom so that we can reveal who God is. We need to be sober-minded. What he gives us, how are we handling it? What are we doing with what he's given to us? So there's three, there's three warnings that we, we see here. And, and if you're at all thinking this morning, hey, where do I stand in this? Am, am I in this rich category? You know, we, we pull up the statistics and maybe you, you've heard something like this before. But, uh, but I said, uh, I was looking up, and if, if we make more than 15000 a year, I could, even, the, even with my missionary salary, I said, I make more than 15000 a year. And I'm in the top 20% in the world. I said, wow, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Wow, my record, wow, $15,000 $15, a year? I, I, if, or in other words, if I have food, if I don't have to think about what I want to eat, uh, about where I want to sleep tonight, or that if I have a, a, reasonable, a reasonably reliable transportation, then I'm, then I'm not in the top 15% of the world's wealthiest people. If I have a reasonably reliable transport, transportation, then Rachel and I think, they're like, man, we've got two cars been given to us. Like, just in what we own alone, wow, that's where I put it. If we make, if we make more than 25,000, we're in the top 10% in the world. Wow. If we're, if we talk about the 1% in America, but in the 1% in the world, if you make over $50,000, you're in the 1% of the world income. Okay. All right, God. Forgive me. Even at that point, I have to stop. I say, God, forgive me. Yeah. That I believe that I have not been a blessed person. Yes. Mm -hmm. But God, you have forgiven me so much. Mm -hmm. So then we get to James, and he says, "Come now, rich people, weep and howl yeah. for misery that is coming on you. I want the things that God has blessed me with for me to think about. God, how can I bring you glory?" in this world and to others. How can I bring you glory to this world and to others? I don't think James is against money this morning. I don't think he's against the rich. He, but he's, un, he's condemning unrighteous uses of riches. Unrighteous uses of the things that God has blessed us with. These things that have been given to us, that not for our own, to puff up our own self, but he is to bless others. It's for God's glory and for the youth and for the others. We sometimes are guilty of, myself included, loving money over loving others, loving people. That's what God has put us on, to spread the love of God to all those who are around. And sometimes our love of money, our love of riches get in the way, and that's what James is getting at this morning. Yeah. That's what he's wanting to, to address. He said, and we're not that we have much because we have much. We don't need to feel guilty because we, we have much, and we, we've been able to get jobs and be able to produce much. Now he's saying, what is the heart issue? What is underneath the layer of that that we can examine our health? Has money so gripped our hearts that it's become more important to us than our relationships with our family, with others? Has it become more important to us than the mission that God has called us to? Has our, our, our possessions become greater than bringing God glory, which is our ultimate goal and our ultimate purpose in life? Amen. If so, then we're in trouble. If so, then we can say, "Wow, God, let let's have it." So we're gonna we're gonna examine three uh, three ungodly practices through James. James is introduces to three ungodly practices. The first one is wasteful hoarding. <coughs> wasteful hoarding. The second one is economic oppression. Oppressing others. Economic oppression. Thirdly is luxurious self indulgence. So these are three ungodly practices that, that James introduces to us this morning. <laughs> Is there actually, I like it when people talk in the, in the message. They, three ungodly practices. Wasteful hoarding, economic oppression, and luxurious self-indulgence. First one here, James 5, 2, and 3. Wasteful hoarding. It says this in verse 2. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. 
their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Ooh. If you claim to or refuse to release the things that you have, you have to ask the question, why? Why do you cling to our money and, and, and have a really hard time doing why do you cling to your stuff and have, have a really hard why do you cling to your time and have a hard time you know getting away with it? Could it be maybe that we find in ourselves we've been hoarding these things, we desire them and we've got we, we want more for ourselves. I don't think we we are, we are guilty if we're hoarding we, we we are hoarding or setting up wisely emergency funds. My, myself I, and my wife, we, we say we'll put a, the money away for, for emergency fund. We have that we have that set up. If, if I'm saving for an expense, say I know in the future my car is going to be breaking down. I, I, cars don't last forever, so I'm putting some money away for car repair or, or for, for a new car because it's eventually I'm going to, I'm going to need that. If I'm, I'm going to be, our, our family is expanding and I need to go get a, a, a larger home, and so okay, I'm going to cut some things on my budget. I'm going to arrange my budget in such a way that I'm going to be able to save for, the, for an expansion of the home. I think those are all wise decisions. But it's when we cling to these things that actually find we're not clinging to them, they're actually clinging to us. Yeah. Right? When, when we, we're, we're so clinging to our money that it's actually clinging to us, it actually has control over us, what we decide to do, what we decide to don't do, how we decide to, to share compassion, how we decide to share love with one another, and how we don't decide. Then we have to examine ourselves. And sometimes it may be from fear. We have to be honest with ourselves. I, I hoard these things, maybe not because I, I want it all for myself, but some, some of it may be a result of fear. What, I don't know if this will happen, so I, I've got to be able to prepare for this tragic event. I, I'm in fear of this thing happening in my life, so I, I'm, I'm going to hoard it for myself instead of, as a result, bringing glory to God, trusting in Him that He would be the one that, that does these things. Instead, we take it on our own responsibility. I, I talked with a few people and I, I read a, a, a few things about people coming uh, through the Great Depression, you know, and then they, they, they went through a time, they learned a, a life of, of scarcity, not having anything, right? And so then they, they have, uh, as a result, they keep everything. Yes. You know, every, you, you may have gone, maybe uh, if you're younger like myself, you may have gone to a certain grandparent's house and, and they got the food containers from every food item they ever purchased <laughs> and they, they got to save up the containers just in case one day they might, won't have yes. the containers. It's a fear that has gripped them yes. that has caused them now to hoard everything, hoard their wealth, hoard everything for themselves. The, care, the scarcity mindset. God has come to free us from that so that we can bring yes. glory for Him. Yes. We have plenty, but sometimes we think we still don't have enough. We're guilty, maybe, of not trusting God for our daily bread. You know, we've got to remember that, and yeah. we're going to look at this later passage here um, about how he, how the wealthy was treating those that were working for them, and, and part of it was that they were they were dependent on their worker who they worked for their employer for their daily provision, right? So right now, maybe we don't really think about that. Most, most of us may have a, a stable job, or right? we, we pretty much may know where our next paycheck will come, or, or relatively what amount may be coming in at a certain day of the month, or multiple days of the month, right? We kind of have may have an idea of that, right? But in this case, they, they were dependent on their wages for their daily provision. And sometimes in our in, in our blessing, in our wealth, we forget to trust God for our daily provisions. Mm -hmm. And we get in this hoarding situation. I, I'm always thinking about myself, I'm always thinking of the future, because I, I actually have to prepare for myself. I don't trust God that He would that He would provide for me my daily bread. Possibly what God is calling us to is to again rely fully on Him for everything that we have. Sometimes it may not be fear, but it may, not, it may be pride. My, my ability to pr provide for myself, to make for myself a future. Remember, Jesus talked about this. He, he, he mentioned a man who, who had planted fields, right? And he had got grain, and so he, he got more grain, and then he had to build more silos. Then he built another silo, and he built, had more grain, so he built another silo. And he, he built up all these things, and he, he looked, uh, and he, at the end of the story, he looked and he could see, he could count how rich he was by how many silos full of grain that he had. 
He wanted to compare himself to others so that he would feel better about himself. See, our identity it cannot be in the stuff that we have, the possession that we have, but it must be, we must revert to our identity being in Christ. Amen. One who was rich but became poor for me. So in my poverty, I can become rich. And the one that pours out all these things for me, our identity is in Him. This morning we sang that we are His child. So if we are His child, it also says that we are heirs to His kingdom. So that we have everything we can possibly imagine. Yeah. Our, wealth, our wealth as believers, those that put our faith in Christ as children of God, our, is expansive. Mm -hmm. Because we are co-heirs to Christ. Hallelujah. We're co-heirs to everything that exists. Amen. It's ours. Talk about a good 401k. Yes. Talk about a good retirement. That's a pretty good. I think I'm setting pretty good. Mm -hmm. I can trust God. Mm -hmm. But instead, we've been traded the truth of God for a lie, and we've started depending on ourselves. But He calls us to put our place in Him, to put our significance on Him, on His high calling, on His 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 identity, Amen. instead of putting our hope in who we are, putting our hope in what we have. It's hard because it's hard because again, last week we were talking. Last week we were talking about planning, right? Planning was a good thing, right? And I was thinking, I love to plan, I love to strategize and figure things out. But sometimes in my in my planning and, and strategizing, I forget to say, I forget to remember that I, I have no control over tomorrow, but God does. So in the same thing here again, talking about our wealth, our wealth isn't. It, it's good to save up. It's good to plan for the future. It's good to have these things. But it's also remember, don't allow our planning or, or hey, I'm in a good situation right now. Things are going okay. So we forget to. Our hope is in Christ. Yes. Our our dependency is on Him for our daily bread, right. not on my own ability, not on my own giftedness, not on my own possessions. Right. Why is it hard to let go? Is it because we have lust in us? We have an unquenchable desire, a hunger inside of us to do one more thing, to buy one more thing, to have one more thing so that we would feel a little bit better, we feel a little bit more secure, so we would have a little bit more happiness, have a little bit more peace in our lives. A heart of lust is that we look to something else to satisfy our hunger deep inside of you that God can only meet. The heart of lust is that we look to something to satisfy our hunger that's deep inside of us other than God that He can only meet. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 real quick. Another story. Jesus is a great teacher. The, this is the parable, the story, a challenge, an encouragement about treasures and where our treasures lie, where our heart is. Is our heart like that, lusting after things, desiring for more things outside of what God can meet? Matthew chapter 6 says this, Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we must store up in heaven where things cannot be destroyed. The things that I have on earth, they will fade away. They, they aren't eternal. I can buy, you know, maybe I, I have a desire one day, God willing, right? Remember that. Not the Christian cliche. Remember that from last week? Sorry. Uh, God willing, maybe one day have a Mustang, be able to, but what, it's going to fade, it's going to be destroyed, it's not going to, it's not going to last. The clothes that I just purchased this week, you know what, in a, in a few years, they're going to be falling apart. They're going to have holes in them, just like my last pair of jeans. And no matter, you know, it, it, but store up in heaven, what would it look like to store up in heaven a treasure? Where it cannot be destroyed, where moths can't get to it, where, birth, where, where it can't go wrong. So treasure, we, we should be treasuring in our hearts, we should be treasuring the work of God, the things of God, or the work for God, above the things that won't last. Amen. The things of God, the works of God, are working for God, above the things that won't last. 
What can I do for you, God? Where can I invest my time in your kingdom? How can I be more involved in what you want to do? How can I be more involved in bringing you glory? How can I be investing in your thing, in heavenly things, in the salvation of men and women, of the, of the raising up of disciples, of the women in the church, of the men in the church, of the children? How can I be investing in these things that matter to you? Yes. That have your heart. Treasure the things of God. Treasure that this is an investment that's going to have the best return. Amen. Right? I, I, mean, I recently started getting into you know saving and okay, okay, I'm looking for what account give me the best interest rate. All right, this one give me one point five. This one has one point eight. I'll go with it. Three point three more. <laughs> the best return on the best investment we can make. Is to get into the kingdom, to get as much of the kingdom, to, to throw ourselves, throw our time, throw who we are into the kingdom. Because in that investment, it can't go to waste. It'll never go to waste. When we give ourselves to God, it'll never go to waste. That's right. It'll always return to us. How's it going to return to us? It's going to return to us because I want to get more, a better job or a better blessing? No, it's going to return to us in the souls of men and women. Yeah. It's going to return to us in kingdom joy. It's going to return to us in kingdom peace. It's going to, it's going to return. And when we invest, our, when we give ourselves, when we draw near to Him, yeah. we're going to give Him. Yeah. It's going to be the best thing for us. Oh, yeah. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Where's your heart? What things are you working for? What things are you thinking about? What most grips your thoughts at night? What? Where is your treasure at? about your neighbor down the road that doesn't know Jesus, about your children growing up in maturity in Christ, it's about your, your spouse receiving the full love of God. Hey, where's your treasure? Where's your heart? We want to invest in something that won't go to waste. If we put our trust in those things, it says that there's going to be a corrosion that happens. If we invest in these worldly things, we invest in these earthly things, it actually corrodes us. It's a self-centered. It shrinks our heart. You come like a Grinch. We get so much, and our heart actually shrinks and hardens. Right? You remember that movie? A heart shrinks, and and, and it, it, we're more that we get, the more that we have, the more that we think about ourselves, the smaller our heart becomes. It corrodes us. But James says it right here. Their corrosion will testify against you. It will eat your flesh like fire. Destruction. Anxiety and lust and greed it destroys us. It destroys our ability to love. It destroys our ability to share who God is. It destroys our ability to show glory. It destroys our ability to share our identity. We have been made in the image of God. And when we think about ourselves, it's opposite of the character of God. Yeah. We've been given much so that we can bless others, not only ourselves. Amen. I heard a story about a father who... Um, was blessed and was able to buy a convertible. And he got his son in the car with them, and you know, their first ride in the convertible. I remember my first time, my grandparents came down to North Carolina, and they had a uh, Chevy, uh, no, a Chrysler, uh, what, a Subaring convertible, red, red Chrysler Subaring convertible. And they drove down from Wisconsin down to North Carolina. And I remember the first time I got to ride in a convertible, um, uh, Car, right? It was. A, I don't care if it was a Mustang or not. It was a convertible. I was like, yes, it's great, right? And that excitement that you win going through your. Anybody riding a convertible? You ever did experience that? All right, top down. It was great. Sunday, right? It's a fun. So this father who takes his son up in the first ride, and the son, he's getting excited. He's like, whoa, this is fun. This is great. Dad, I love this car. And his dad pulls over to the side of the, the side of the road, turns off the car. And told his son, son, we don't love things. That's right. We love people. Amen. We love people. Amen. We love the things that God loves. We love people. When we get the thing, sometimes he told his son, sometimes we get things, if, if we get things confused, mm -hmm. we'll use people to love things. Mm -hmm. Instead of using things to love people. If we get it confused, we'll use people to love things, to get the things we love, instead of using the things we have to love people. Yeah. Different mindset. Different mindset. And we need to 
explained to his son he enjoys his car because his son was enjoying it. But we can't get those things confused. We can't get it confused. And we're talking about uh, who can host the missional community. You know, we're, we know we're challenging people. We're challenging people with this thought of life on life, life in community, life on mission, that everything we have is for the glory of God. And we, we know this is challenging. This isn't like easy for us to invite somebody in my house because, man, if I invite somebody in my house, what if they get the carpets dirty? What if they spill food? Uh, I'm thinking of all the different things that have happened in the last year in, in, our, in our little apartment. You know, in, in October we had you know, 20 people in our living room. Now we're, we're, we're a smaller group, but, uh, but you know, in how many people, you, dishes get used, things might break, things might spill, and the carpet gets dirty. I've got to clean the carpet every once in a while because there's so many footprints going in. You know, they, things might get used in my house. I mean, I have to invite them into my privacy. You know, sometimes I don't feel like hosting people in my house on Wednesday nights. Uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> As I was talking with somebody, and they said, yeah, well, I invited a church group into my house, and the kids were running around in the bedroom, and they broke one of these, uh, they, had a, they had a picture frame that they had made, and they had hand-painted on the picture frame, like all these beautiful designs, and had the, had the pictures behind it, a nice piece of glass and everything, and the kids were upstairs running around, and when they ran around, it fell off the wall, and it broke. Oh. Right? Terrible. But man, for the kingdom, it's just a thing. What's greater? To love the thing or to love the people? James is challenging us. James is challenging us. What's that? Control the kids. Control the kids. <laughs> control the kids. Nothing specifically. It is your room. Sit here. Do nothing. We're going to go learn about Jesus. Yes. No, it's real life. It's real life. It's real life. It's real life. Yes. Yes. Now we have real life together. We share the things that we love with those who are around us and they see who God is and they desire Him more and more. And so we are challenging you. We know we're challenging you when we say, open up your home. Consider, can you open up your home? This fall, we're not going to have two missional communities, whether you guys like it or not. We're going to have somebody else is going to be hosting a missional community in their home. <laughs> it's going to happen. Amen. Let's get this. Let's get this. Life on life, life in community, life on mission, it happens because of the glory of God. Because he says, everything that has been given to me is for others. It's for others. It's to love others. It's to share his kingdom. It's to share who he is with others. So maybe that does require us to think about our time, our home, our possessions. Because if not, I love how James says this to me. So this, this is James's words. <laughs> if not, it's going to eat you up like a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Your flesh will be eaten up like fire. Yeah. I don't want it to happen. God, I pray right now that our possessions don't get such a grip on us. Yes. Amen. Father, yes. that we can't show you glory, that we can't love other people through the possession we have. Father, we don't want to be destroyed. Father, we don't want to be corroded. Father, we don't want to be destroyed by fire. We don't want the things that you've given to us, that you've blessed us with. Father, we become so controlling in our life, Father, that we can't think about your kingdom. Yes. We can't think about our neighbor down the hall. We can't think about the, the, the friend with kids that, that they may be messy, they may be out of control, they may have a different situation. Father, we want to love people yes. more than your possessions. Yes. In Jesus' name, let it be so. Yes. Romans 2 5 says this because of your hard hearts and imparted heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. When when God brings righteous judgment, He will be revealed. Father, help us now. Take care. Second thing it says. Uh, remember the first point. Second point is economic oppression. James five verse four. James five verse four. How is our wealth causing economic oppression? Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. I love scripture, and, and when we do our Bible studies on uh, Wednesday nights, we, we love to ask the question, uh, who is God, what is he doing? What is he doing in the scripture? So uh, this, this particular part of uh, James really reveals something amazing about, about who God is, his character says that the, 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 the cries of the harvesters, they cry out against you. This cry out against you, it's, it's the same cry out that God used in Genesis when Cain and Abel, when Cain and Abel and, and, and killed his brother, right? And 
God comes and he, and he asks them, you know, what's, where's your brother at? He says, I can hear the cries of your brother's blood. Yeah. It cries out to me. That same, the blood of your brother cries out to me is the same crying that it says the, that, that these people, the harvesters, they're, those, they're crying out against you. In this situation, it is, a, it is the deepest kind of cry out. In this situation, they, they, like I mentioned earlier, they are dependent on their employer for their daily wages. It wasn't something they, they could think about. They had a paycheck, a schedule, their taxes taken out, they get a little pay stub. You know, that wasn't happening. It was like, okay, I've worked all day long, now I need my supply for the day. They didn't have a Costco, they didn't have refrigeration, they, 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 they needed their basic food. You know, how I, they needed to care for their family. And they were holding the wages from the laborers. Man, this is, this is a hard, this hard thing. Uh, we, we may not think, oh, I, I may not be in that same situation, but hey, if you're a manager, if you're hiring, if you're a boss, if, you, if you're evaluating anybody's skill level or those who are around you, then we have responsibility to give bonuses and give raises. I mean, you could be in that same situation. I mean, if you have anybody fix your car, anybody have anybody fix your car lately, doing lawn care, you know, we'd love to get the, the greatest benefit for our least expense. Ever, any, anybody else get out here really good uh, uh, winter, you know, right? And try to, you know, hey, can I, can I get this for this amount, this amount? We, we always try to get the, be the best for us at the, at the least expense, right? Man. I don't want to be that way. I'm reading the scripture, I was, they, they, they cry out against me. Always trying to get Andrew coming in, always trying to get a deal, always trying to get better out of myself. Always trying, hey, can I get this for a little bit cheaper? Can I do a little, work it out a little better for myself? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult problem. I, I, I work at, at now a manager at Curry the Box, so I got some people working for me. They're working, they're working 12 hours a day. 12 hours a day. And some of the, the, my owner's responsibility to branch this in, we work 12 hour a day, six days a week. Crazy. I don't know, I don't know how, what, what we can start selling our curry for so we can start raising, raising our wages but they don't have to work so much. They, they, one of our family, they have 10 kids, both husband and wife working in the kitchen 12 hours a day. Just so they can survive, right? They, they're crying out. We have people working two, three jobs we got fathers and mothers doing uh, pizza delivery at night here in Madison just so they can meet the bills. Man, what a great opportunity to show some blessing, to show some generosity, to show who God is. Am I obligated to do it? No, you're not obligated to do it. No. Uh, what God may want to give a little picture of who He is to those who are serving us. Yes. We don't. We we just go just normal life. Oh, I know it's it's ten percent or twenty percent, right? A good tip. You know, people ask me all the time. They're at the cash register. They go to the cash register. They're like, Do I have? They have a tip line on the credit card thing. That do I need a tip here at credit box? I think you do what you need to do. You know, you do. But but I know. <laughs> I'm not saying we're all the. But if it's a blessing that God has given us, and they have an opportunity to, to share what God has given me, and so that other somebody else can walk away with a better image of who yes. God is, hey, I'm going to go for it. Yes. You know, I went to a, the restaurant the other day, and we got to pay. I, I got to pay the, the same amount of my bill. I got to pay in tip. And God bless me, God. I had that amount. I could do it. I could, and I blessed them. I wasn't trying to judge them in their situation. I didn't know. I just. Spirit said, go ahead. And I'm praying that, hey, they got a better picture of who God is because of the way I was Amen. with my money. Hallelujah. With the wealth that God gave me. What if we became a church that, like just said in, in January, we said we're going to be a church that is outrageously generous. And it starts with those kind of things, those kind of little, little tasks. James is so amazing to hear, and it's encouraging that he says this. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. There's injustice that's happening around the world. Maybe here in America we have so many laws and regulations that, that we may not have these, these labor factories and these harsh working environments, but we think about where we're getting our products from, where our, where our shirts are coming from, where our clothes are coming from, different harvesters and where, where our produce is coming from, and, and how their wages are being met. And it says here that 
that God, he hears the cry of the workers. Yes. He hears the injustice. What, what the, that tells me something good about who God is. That God is a God of justice. That God does hear the cry. That God do, is coming in judgment. That he is coming to bring justice to these situations. God's going to have the final word. Yes. You hear about these terrible situations. These kids laboring. So what can we do about it? The question for us is, are we going to join God in caring for these injustices? We can do it. We can be a part of the solution. We want to be a church that, that is known for joining Him in bringing justice to the injustice situation you see around God didn't make us to work six days a week, seven days a week. Yes, God hears the cries. Are we going to join Him in doing it? You know, I used to make that made me make jokes even about um, my siblings about how they how they uh, purchase certain things. You know, they, they check there's a list that we can purchase in, that you can look at and find out where your clothes, what clothes, and how your clothes are, are made, and what factories and how the the conditions of those factories are where they're made. God hears the cries of those people crying out for the injustice of the wages that they, they're getting, the, 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 the bad wages that they're getting for the work that they're doing. We can start by even checking that list. Like, hey, where are these cl the clothes that I'm getting? Where are they being made? How are they being, what are the factories that they're in? Are they getting just wages for the things that they're, they're doing? God is hearing their cries. Yes. We can start by just doing that. We can start by doing a little, having a little generosity in our tipping. We can start by, hey, not having to haggle our way to the best price for us at their expense. These are practical ways. When we're at a restaurant, man, serving the people that, ser that served us. Start with a small thing. For best to be a blessing. My desire is, I hope our desire is, that somebody would walk away knowing they were cared for by God. Yes. That's how it is. That's what he's giving you. They're cared for by God. My workers are cared for by God. The people that are serving me, they're cared for by God. Yes. By the way I treat, by the way I spend. Third thing, third point James gets at is, our luxurious self-indulgence. James chapter 5, verse 5, says this, You lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. We are destructive to humanity around us by our self-indulgence. We're not saying we shouldn't enjoy good things, things that last. But, do we enjoy them without restraint? Yes. Do they feed your appetite? Do they encourage you? Do they uplift you? Do they control you? Let's practice our no muscle. No, you don't need that. No, that's, I don't have to buy that. No, I don't have to go there. No, I don't have to... Spend that. When I think about what I want to do, do I think about how what I need to do to get it? When I get something else, does it cause me to need more? I need the next thing. Does it cause me to have to get the next thing at the expense of somebody else? Expense of my family, expense of my children, expense of my spouse. I have to spend more time working so that I can get more, so that I can have more. C.S. Lewis said, uh, had this article, you can look it up, says, uh, How much should I give? How does giving play into all this? Maybe we should give to the point that it hurts. When's the last time that you gave to the point that it hurts? Give something away to the point that it actually hurt me, that it actually cost me something, that it actually, uh, that it actually affected my budget lines. Uh, we went through a time where we did a, uh, actually went through a time to learn how to budget our, our finances, right? So now, every two weeks, we're 
writing down every penny where we spent every penny. We got it all categorized, we got it all. So I know there, there's times where I say, hey, Rachel, we're going to give this amount, or I know that I'm going to have to subtract it from this budget over here. So maybe it's our date, date night. We plan, we, we give about $100 a month to go to dates. That's usually maybe three, three meals a month or something like that. We do three fun things a month together as a couple. So sometimes God says, hey, Andrew, there's, here's a need. What if, I would like you to do something about it. I give, I give an amount of money, and so then Rachel and I have to decide, okay, where in the budget are we going uh, to cut so that we can supply this? Maybe we're going to cut our, our entertainment, or we're going to cut our, who we're going to buy over this month, because it's going to cost us this month, so that we can meet a need. A, a, a fun thing to do, we heard a story about a, a family who uh, had a, actually had a rental property. And the, the, the people that were renting their property were getting ready for an adoption, and the adoption was going to require them to go overseas to Kenya and to, to, ha to spend a month in Kenya for the baby and all of the different processes for that. And so they all this rental property, and that family wasn't going to be able to work that month because they had to be in Kenya for the month. Right? So they needed to know that they didn't know how they were going to pay for their rent and, and have the thing. And so the family that owned the property, they got together at the dinner table with their children. And they said, hey, this is a need that we have. This, this family, they're going overseas, and they, don't, they can't pay for their bills. So how are we going to cut our budget? How is it going to hurt us so that they can be blessed? So one of the kids piped up, well, hey, we've been saving, and I have, I have $100 in my savings account. I could give towards, uh, towards the, the monthly payment so that they can, they can have their time in Kenya. And the other kids like, yeah, I could give some of my savings. And hey, I could mow, I could mow three more grasses this week so that, so that I, could, I could bless them and then they could do these things. It became a family thing and a way, not only family, the training on, hey, this is what we do. We help the kingdom, we help people, we love people over our possessions. We use the things that we have for people, not people to get more things. And so, God may be asking us in this, hey, where, where is the generosity? When's the last time have we felt the pain, the weight of gener our generosity? Or had it cost us to actually give? If there's anyone who has suffered to give, it was Jesus. Well, we have an example that Jesus suffered, he died to give us life, to give. Yes. It cost us. Sometimes God asks us generosity, not just to give out of our surplus, but to give to a point of encouragement. Yeah. Jesus tells the story of people who, who love money. In Luke chapter 16, he talked about a, a man who is rich and wealthy, but there was a beggar that sat at his, at his gate every day. He did nothing about it. The dog came in to lift the wounds of this man. And then he went, and they, they both passed, and he found that the Lazarus, Lazarus had found himself in, in the bosom of Abraham, in heaven. And the rich man had found himself separated from God, and he desired to take part in this blessing. But it was too late. The fires had already destroyed him. Praying, God, don't allow the fire to destroy us. Don't allow the fire to destroy us. Don't allow it to be too late for us to declare who God is to those who are around us. Amen. The Spirit is among us and He wants us to heed His Word. Yes. He wants us to get this. He wants us to be a people that reflect Jesus. Remember, it's not against the wealth that we have, but it's against the fact that we have not shown who God is through the things that He's given us. Yes. We have an opportunity because we are blessed, because we are blessed people, to give to others, to show who God is. Our prayer is that just as James encouraged others, that we would be somebody who blesses others and people get a glimpse of who God is through the way that we spend our money. Remember, we don't do this for acceptance. We don't give, we aren't generous, we don't give away, we don't bless others for acceptance. We already have the acceptance. And because of our acceptance, now we bless others. Because we are blessed, we bless them. Because we are loved, we love them. Because He was generous towards us, we are generous towards others. Not to get the generosity of God, not to get the love of God, not to get the blessing of God, not to get the acceptance of God. No, I am this. Yes. We are this in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Now we do this. And the flow in which we live, so that God gets the glory. And it's not on our own. So how should we respond? James introduces us to this in James, in, in Verse 1, we should weep and wail. 
because there's misery that's coming upon us. We find ourselves in a place that we have been captivated by the wealth that we have, we've been captivated by things, we've been working towards everything for ourselves. And a, we need to come to repentance. But the beautiful thing about God is in James chapter 4, verse 6 and 8, that we find, right, that God gives grace to the humble. Amen. When we realize our wrong, He makes it right. When we realize our wrong, He lifts us up. When we realize our wrong, we come before Him. He says, yes, my servant. And He lifts us up. Yes, it's true of us. He doesn't deny it's true. He doesn't ignore our sins. That's not what grace is. Grace doesn't ignore our sins. It admits our sins. He sees it anyway. He forgives it. And He lifts us up. And He restores us. Yeah. So we're going to find ourselves in a place of this morning where we're saying more oh me's and oh my's than all right, keep going. That's a great place for us to be in. James says we can be in misery. And when we do so, we find grace. And God lifts us up and he changes our heart. Grace is greater. We must remember that we can't be so greedy that God can't forgive us. Say that. We can't have too much sin that God can't forgive us. We can't be so much of a hoarder that God can't be, uh, give, us, uh, give us more. And we can't be so self-indulgent that God can't uh, get rid of our selfishness and bring us in salvation. Because salvation trumps, salvation is greater, His restoration is greater than anything we find ourselves currently in. Anything we find ourselves currently in, anything we find ourselves in the Holy Spirit, anything, His salvation, His grace, His power in us is great. To bring us out. But we should feel it this morning. We should feel it. We should say, oh, yeah, God. Man, where are my possessions at? Where? Wow. Oh, God, forgive me. I've been a little bit more stingy. I, I've hoarded things for myself. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been cutting the corners so that you know, it would benefit me more than the workers that are working for me. But praise you, God. He gives me grace. That if we draw near to Him, we get cleansed. You know, remember, let's look at that again. This is powerful. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 7. We're back, I'll start in verse 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is an amazing process, and I hope you guys get this. Because this truth is going to transform how we view God and how we interact with God. Yes. So these moments where we say, oh me, oh my, right? We have, oh, we have this conviction. A lot of times we want to make ourselves better to get to God. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me straighten up this act in my life. Let me, let me figure it out. Okay, I'll start being more generous. Okay, then you can be more accepting of me, God. I can be more generous and I'll get more. Okay, I'll get things in order, God, and I'll come before you. No, actually it says it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. We draw near to God to get cleansed. We draw near to God to keep cleansed. We, in the state that we we find ourselves, hey, I'm a mess. I got such, I got stuff. It is convicting. We go, we go straight to God. And we go straight to God. Then He cleanses us. He 